I really enjoyed a piece you wrote about um, this new film about the two poles, but I, I quickly want to ask you to recount the story about the time you went to prison or jail, whichever you call it, because uh, you had a, a, an infuriating run in with the system. And the reason I want to bring this up is it has clearly been established over the last two and a half hours that you are not a career politician, but you're kind of a reluctant uh, election candidate. But, but yeah. one, one funny local issue specific to Donnery and I'm sure other places in, in Ireland uh, is that of parking and the yeah. neglect or the death of town centres and, and all that. So, yeah. yeah. So, well, John Leary uh, is a town, is, is uh, a, you know, the biggest town near where I've been living for the last 30 years. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm right on the fringe of it now, actually. And I love Don Leary. You know, it's, it's a very nice town and there's many qualities and particularly, you know, the harbour area and all that is beautiful. And, and uh, but the town itself, the core of the town is somewhat uh, run down now in recent uh, uh, decades, you know, it's uh, what you might call gap toothed because there's so many shops that have been closed down and charity, not a charity shops, that kind of thing, which is kind of coffee shops, a lot of coffee shops, which come and go, you know, and, and which are, are hard for people to, to keep going. And, um, and for many years, there was a company here, Abcoa, who were the, doing the traffic and they were absolutely draconian. On the, the, you know, I mean, I, I, I can kind of understand the necessity to, you know, police parking in a, in a town and, you know, parking charges are one way of doing that, but it has to be done in a balanced way. And it cannot be used as a way of exploiting people who are simply there using the facilities of the town, which in effect is their town, which is their town and which, you know, it's their country and they have built their country and they've built their towns because they have worked and they need deserve to be treated by respect, not to be bled dry by the authorities, you know, in the guise of, you know, uh, policing the streets, mm -hmm. you know. Now, and the example I have raised, I have made in this, and, and people look at me open mouthed when I say this because it never occurred to them, and and um, they try and pick holes in it, but there's actually no hill, holes to be picked in it because it's absolutely watertight. I've always said, you know, that it is completely unjust to slap a fifty, sixty, or seventy euro fine on somebody because they have overstayed on a meter for a few minutes or even for a half an hour or even for the course of an hour because I don't believe that there are very many people going around the place seeking to evade paying their legitimate yes. dues and my point is this that if you uh, park on the street and there's a parking charge well then okay you mightn't like it but you pay it now the, the idea that the fine is if you if your meter runs out and you, a car is still there, that there's some kind of assumption almost of quasi-criminality that you have tried to defraud the council of something. When in fact, all that may have happened is that you got caught in a big queue in the post office or you ran into an old friend in the street and didn't want to be impolite by running away. And instead you come back and you find that you've been fined 70 euros or something which for a lot of, for some people might be a hell of a lot of money. For others, it's nothing, which is another injustice about the whole idea. And I always say, well, hang on. Look, if I park my car on the side of the street, I put some money into the meter. I'm intending to come back at a certain time. If that doesn't work out, just because I come back late doesn't mean that I'm not willing to pay whatever balance is owed. But the council doesn't give me any opportunity to do this because there's no mechanism by which I can top up the payment I've already made. Instead, I get this extortionate fine simply because there was a queue in the post office. That is profoundly unjust. Now, this thing, people, journalists in particular, when I did this, uh, journalists, where I was slagged by journalists, like, oh. Were you clamped or just ticketed? Just ticketed. Uh, what happened was I, I had topped up the meter. There's a 15-minute grace period and I was rushing back to meet the end of the deadline, because I knew approximately, but I was a minute out. Now, as it happens, actually, I didn't cop this at the time, but a lot of these meters are not in sync. So one may be a couple of minutes fast, another may be a couple of minutes slow. So where that stood, I don't know. But anyway, I was, I was 30 seconds late, I would say, coming back. 
And the traffic warden had already slapped the ticket and was scuttling up a back lane. I just saw his heels going around the corner as I was trying. Was he running or walking? He was running pretty hard. He was getting away because that's what they do. They wait, you see. They skulk around waiting to pounce on somebody. So I said, I ran up and he was gone. I couldn't get him. I don't know what I've done to him if I got him. I, 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 God knows. Ask Rita, my wife. She'll tell you. She's, she, you know, she, she's, she's despairs of my, uh, whatever. What would I call it? Temper, maybe. Impetuousness. I don't know. But I just feel angry when this level of extortion is, is, is perpetrated by state forces, particularly. So I resolved there. And then, I'm, well, I'm certainly not paying this. Like, now, if I were the kind of person who had habitually been clocking up parking tickets, yeah. I could understand why they would. But I hadn't had a ticket for years, and I haven't had a ticket since, even though I've lived in this area all for 30 years and have been driving a car all that time. That kind of tells you how out of proportion all this stuff is. And so I thought, ah, well, look, they're not going to pursue it for the sake of one minute, because in one minute, I think I think I've broke it down to about two and a half cents will be the, the monetary equivalent of the shortfall, right? And lo and behold, they did. They started sending me summonses. And, uh, you know, next thing, there's someone to appear in court. So I went in to court and well, well prepared to explain my case to the judge. And I thought I had a good case to make. And uh, as though to, to bolster my case, the, ca the case, the courts were running late that day. So I had topped up my meter down the street. But before my case was able to come up, which was so far beyond the point at which I was told the case approximately would come up, mm. that I, I had to raise my hand and say, excuse me, judge, would you mind if I went out and topped up my meter? Because uh, I'm, you know, I'm running out of time. Yeah. And I said, oh no, that's fine, that's fine. And I, I, ironically, when I was gone, my case was called, so I had to put it at the end of the list. You know, so I mean, like, you, you could, if I was writing a play about this, I wouldn't have to write. You know, I, I would just yeah. run the tape recorder on the whole thing. And uh, so she didn't listen to my argument, and she listened to the traffic warden, who you know was a very skulky, very shifty-looking individual. Uh, but anyway. Uh, uh, people say these guys are just doing jobs. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, there must be other jobs that a grown man can do. But anyway, uh, so then, lo and behold, I thought, well, they're going. They're certainly not going to drag me off to jail for this, are they? Mm. But they did. Like, it was quite extraordinary. They told me, yeah, we're going to come for you. And it, we had, I had to make an appointment to meet with the guards and in Dunleary Garda Station. And uh, I was taken off to uh, to Wheatfield. And the guard, I was sitting in the back of the car, there was two guards in front and one guard beside me. Now this is for two and a half cents, mind you. Remember, two for two and a half cents, keep that in mind. And the, the guard beside me is a very nice, decent fella. We have a grand chat. But the first of all, he says, he says, John, I won't cuff you now, he says, you know, just, just to let you know, I, I, I trust you're not going to know. Yeah. Imagine, even the question of that you would be manacled in a modern democracy for two and a half cents. What have we come to? So we went off to Wheatfield and, and I'm having a great chat with the guard and get there. And then when I get to the Wheatfield where I'm, I'm photographed and fingerprinted and weighed and my height is taken, six, five foot, 11, three quarters is my official height. And I'm sticking to it. Uh, so, I then I'm put into a cell, but well, no, it's not really a cell, it's more like a bus stop with bars around it, with two other fellas, one of whom is coming in and the other is going out. And we sit there for an hour and a half having a great chat, and they bring us a dinner, which is inedible, and I just give it really? back. Yeah, it's kind of spaghetti bolognese, I suppose they would have called it, but it was, I don't want to say what it was like. Like, it, it was pretty horrendous looking, and I didn't have it. And then they, they came and... Uh, the guy came and says, no, you're, they're letting you off now, he says. And, uh, and then as they're going out, they, they, the chief warden or whatever says to me, he says, how are you getting home? I says, I don't know. Uh, uh, I suppose I'll, I'll go out and I'll see if I can find a bus. He says, well, uh, do you want a bus ticket? 
And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much the bus costs or anything, you know. And he says, well, and so the, the, anyway, the meaning of that is that if I'd been going to Donegal, they would have given me a bus ticket for 35 quid or something. Whatever it is, yeah. No bother for two and a half cents. All in the deal for two and a half cents, right? Uh, can you calculate the cost to the uh, Irish taxpayer of that uh, adventure? Well, I know. Now you have it. And I know what you're going to say, Fergus. I know what you're going to say. What you're am I going to say? say? You're going to put on your journalistic high hat. No, no, no. Oh, John Lawrence, you, you put, impose these charges on the taxpayer yourself. Is that what you're going to say? It is, isn't it? That's, I was what, they all say. Said. That's what they all said to me. But, John, I was, yeah, I was going to say something similar. I was going to say. If your concern was the, the cost of the taxpayer. No, no, I'm just I'm just making the point to show how ludicrous the state is, how stupid the state is. Here's a system which not, should not exist. There should be a meter on the side of the street whereby you come along, you park your car, you, there's, a, there's a pad there, you, you put in your registration number, your start time, mm. you press the button, off you go. You come back when you're finished, you press another button, it finishes up, it tells you. You know, you can put in your card details as well, actually. Now, they have these on the street, by the way, now, for, but they haven't got them in this way. So why can't you do that? Why and can't they, you? Yeah, there's something similar in uh, in shopping centres. You go yes. at the start and at the end, yeah. Exactly. Why shouldn't there be? They say, oh, well, people wouldn't pay. Well, if they don't, you have the registration number. You know, and the, the, the warden can go around and make sure that all the meters have registration numbers put into so, them. So did you take that up? What year was this? Uh, 2012. OK, so bear with me here. The, the TDs would have been Richard Boyd Barrett, Mary Mitchell O'Connor. Was she a T? I, I don't know who they were. Sean Barrett was definitely one. There there were a number of local representatives and, and a number of councillors. Did you take it up with any of them? Oh, I mentioned it to various people, but I mean, uh, you see, they'd been fighting this. In fairness to them, people like Barrett had been uh, uh, Boy Barrett had been fighting these things for years. It was well known that this had done untold damage to the town. There was a huge campaign in the town. I mean, that's the other context. And I was aware of that. And I had been to many About public, the meetings, parking. public meetings. Yeah, and the people were really uh, at their wit's end in the town. They were being absolutely crucified uh, by these wardens going around the place, driving their customers away. Because, you know, by then, the, the centre in the drum, drum centre had opened up and you could go on there at the time, it's slightly more now, but you could, for two euros, you could get three hours of parking. Perfectly safe, no bother. And even if you went over, you just went to put in the extra money. There was no fines. And, and if you came to your own local town, you were running the risk of being, you know, because it can happen. You know, you're around the town and you meet somebody and you're having a chat. Yeah. The next thing you, you forget, that's not a crime. It shouldn't be a crime. And, and you know, you know, this is this seems like a minor thing, but actually it isn't a minor thing. Shops are all the time closing down in the town. Uh, Tesco, so, uh, Marks and Spencer's had a fine shop in the town at that point. It's, it closed subsequently. I used to go in and get the, the cookies in there with my friends and, and the, yeah. the little Percy pigs. What, what, um, what locally is your plan, if any, for Dunleary, if elected? Oh, well, I think uh, Dunleary speaks for a hell of a lot of towns all over, over Ireland that has been grossly neglected and, and, and uh, you know, that we have no plan. We have no view of the town. We have no sense of what a town is. A town is a facility, is a, is a residential place, is a place for people to live in, and that's an essential element of it. If you look at most towns now around Ireland, if you go there after dark and walk down the street after the shops have closed and look upwards, you won't see lights in the upper rooms at all. People are no longer living over those shops, uh, and and uh, uh, that's a terrible thing, you know, that you feel that your town is dead after dark, uh, and that people have moved out to the suburbs, you know, and and by the same token, you know, you have little Analdi out in the suburbs, are out on the fringe of the town, sucking people the life out of the town again in a different way. Uh, uh, give, no... Giving people cheap cheap groceries as well, but go on. Well, that's exactly part of the problem. I mean, people are being bribed to destroy their own, the fabric of their own lives. You know, you get a few f cheap f uh, items in, in, in one of these shops, but the cost of it is that in, in 20 years' time, you won't have a town. You know, I mean, people need to think a little bit more long-term about their well, welfare. you're feeding your family. It, uh, you could say the same about climate change, like you, you prioritise your, your family's well-being now. Well, I, I, it's a, there's a balance to be struck, and, and I think yes. they're getting the balance wrong. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I accept what you say. I mean, because there, there is 
I know this. I know that uh, there is a, a, a quite a significant differential between what Little and Aldi can do and what the normal uh, everyday uh, supermarket or, or, or shop can do. Uh, and well, in fairness to them, they have created a certain degree of convergence in the prices of things, and that's been a good thing. But there's an imbalance here where these uh, massive global operators are coming in and they're settling on the fringes of towns. Mm. whereby they're sucking people out and they don't actually, you know, they should be, there should be a law or a rule or whatever, or a practice that those ta- those are required to set up in the middle of towns. John, it's it's heartbreaking actually to see that that happens regardless of Little or Aldi specifically, but you see that in towns way more dramatically in America. I don't know if you've witnessed mm. this, but yes. everything is taken to the outskirts. And yes. it's really, I find it very demoralizing uh, yes. being in, uh, downtown, and I'm told by people, what are you talking about downtown? There is no downtown in this town because everything is out on the bypass. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. I've, seen, I've seen that. I mean, I've seen that. Or near the interstate, you know, and, yeah. and it's all, it's and, all and the it's, same. But I wonder what on earth can, and I don't, again, not to be patronizing or condescending, but what on earth can you do about this? This is a, a massive economic phenomenon, isn't it? Well, yeah, but I mean, it, it happened by osmosis and it can be redressed by osmosis. You osmosis know, which, meaning what? Well, a gradual change that is almost imperceptible. I mean, we can actually create new conditions which will incentivize people to go back, for example, and live over their own shops or to rent out those shops, mm. those upper rooms to, to, to tenants, which will restore life to the town. And, and also, and that's very important for the security of towns and the safety of towns, because you have a lot, what actually happens with these vacant towns after dark is you get a lot of drug taking and criminality of various yes. kinds, which is that there, is the fabric and the safety of the place. So it, that's what, these things are all interconnected. You need a holistic approach to- You to, do. Uh, and I mean, I come from a small town, you know, in Castlery in County Roscommon. And I mean, it's in some ways a, a model, you know, it used to be when I was a kid, it's hard to believe now, but Castle, when I was a kid, Castlery was second only to Galway in terms of shopping towns in Connacht, because it had it's some of the biggest department stores in, yes. in, in the west of Ireland, E.J. McDermott's, Byron's, Winston's. Uh, you know, it had a huge bakery, Dyer's Bakery, which supplied virtually the whole of Connacht to, with bread. Uh, like. That's all gone now. It's gone, and and that needs to be addressed. And 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 you know, but but I suppose the the point I would make here is that the political class have not the slightest interest in anything like that. You see, I I, I this has struck me about politics, and I I mean, to be honest with you, uh, Fergus, I I have to accept a certain degree of the blame in some respects because I have written in a way that kind of I won't say celebrated, but tolerated or indulged, say, indulged is a word, the kind of cuteness of the Irish political culture, the cute whorism, you know, that, that there was a certain element of that that is kind of funny and, and, you know, whimsical and so on. But the cost of it has been very high in the, to the fabric of our society. And one of the things I, I really, when I became a journalist, uh, realized going to political meetings or listening to people who were politicians who were starting out, weren't necessarily the hardcore people. Yeah. I met them as well. But that the whole imperative of politics at the grassroots level seemed to have nothing whatsoever to do with, with the fabric of life in the community or in the country, but was entirely predicated on getting elected. Mm-hmm. And, and so therefore, as it were, everything was just fodder to that process. So if there was an issue, if the, to- if the towns, the traders had an issue, like say parking or whatever it was, the, polit- the political aspirants would actually take that up. But in that way, not in any passionate way for their town yeah. or for, but you know, to say, well, I done that for you now, you know, mm. uh, you know, I did you, I did you a stroke there, you know, and uh, uh, you owe me type of thing. And uh, that's all wrong. You know, I mean, th- that discouraged many passionate people who are genuinely interested in things to do with the community from going into politics. And that has done severe damage to the fabric of our country because you don't have a political class which cares about things. And that's why you don't, politics in Ireland is not geared around the question of improving the, the, the public spaces for the citizens. Mm-hmm. For that should be the primary pro- purpose of politics. Uh, well, first of all, securing the borders, protecting the people, 
and then making people happier insofar as it can. I think there, there, there are a lot of decent politicians out there, though, aren't there? There are decent people, but there's something that happens to them when they go into power. And we've seen this time and time again in relation to very issue, very several issues in particular. You know, we saw it in relation to the pro-life issue. I mean, like the pro-life issue, I won't want to mention names now, but the pro-life, the, the abortion referendum was essentially driven by people who had, within a very short time, space of years, been pro-life, avowedly pro-life, enthusiastically pro-life. And now here they were promoting this issue and nobody had any explanation as to why they had changed. You know, that's very, very demoralizing for people in a society who believe in things and who they change their mind. You, you, you might question their uh, intentions, but yeah, I, I know what you mean. I don't, I don't know. Ch changing their mind doesn't get it, you know. No, the, the, no because I mean, when you have all of the, the senior figures in a political party, as one man, change their minds, unquote, go on a journey, unquote. Um, you know, you have to start asking, did these people encounter somebody who... Yeah, what's going on here, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's kind of, I think there's a devaluation and a, and a, and a debate, debasement of politics. Uh, and, and I don't think people any longer have any faith in the political system. I mean, this has been going on for a long time now, but I think it has reached a certain level in this election. Uh, I don't necessarily know if it will help me or to get elected. I don't know. I, mean, I, I couldn't tell you how many votes I got. I have no idea if, whether I'll get 10 votes or 10,000, possibly more, uh, closer to 10 than 10,000, but that remains to be seen. But, you know, uh, I, I, there's something very strange about this election, as there was about the last one in 2016. And I put it like this, that people feel that such is the configuration of the political system now, that there's nothing they can do to exercise autonomy in respect of changing the direction of things in the public realm. That the political system is in effect inert, philosophically. I understand. You know, in other ways. That it doesn't matter who they elect in terms of the main parties. Uh, they still won't achieve anything that they need to do in their country. Uh, that if they vote out Fine Gael and vote in Fianna Fáil, it's just musical chairs. Because Fianna Fáil have supported Fine Gael for the last four years, and for the next four, Fine Gael will support Fianna Fáil, something yeah, like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, all, and then you'll have this raggle-taggle uh, bunch of lefties sitting in the back row, the Bash Street kids, shouting and roaring, but not achieving anything, and not really doing anything or, or proposing anything of any note or weight for Irish society in general. And we've had no op opposition. I mean, we've introduced the most radical changes to our constitution in the past, since Enda Kenny became teacher in 2011. Three of the most radical in uh, referendums, the three most radical inter uh, referendums we've ever had, the three most radical amendments to our constitution we've ever had, which were against Article 40, Article 41, and Article 42. Um, in reverse order, actually, more or less, but uh, those three articles. Now, this is very particular. Most of the Constitution is, is actually constructed on the basis of, you know, human rights or laws or administration or, you know, protocols or conventions in order to administer the state and its institutions, right, shall we say. And there's all that stuff all over the constitution. And scattered among that, just a certain, uh, you know, extension of rights by the state to the individual and the citizen, right? But Articles 40 to 44 are of a particular kind. They are the fundamental rights, are articles of the constitution. They're the, the, artic they're the rights which actually are not given to us by the state. They're not given to us by ourselves. They're given to us under natural law, if you like, by God. The Constitution, the preamble starts off in the name of the most holy trinity, in whom is all authority, and to whom as our final end, all matters of men and of states must be referred. And that's the, 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 that's the, the principle which protects your rights, Fergus, and mine. Because what that does is it takes those fundamental rights and places them out of the reach 
of human beings. Therefore, out of the reach of tyranny. So you don't have to be a believer in the most holy trinity to actually see the functionality of that principle. And those rights, you see, this, this is the, the real uh, scandal of these three referendums, that none of them should have happened at all because they were not rights that were given to us by ourselves and therefore we had not the right to take them away. Well, John, surely on, on the one hand, you have to be able to amend. They do that in America too. They amend the constitution. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and of course the other second, articles. But the second thing is that you say these are natural rights, but they're de Valera's uh, brainchild. No, no, they're not. No, they're not. Where, where do they come from? They come from God. Well, who, like he didn't write it with his inky finger, to use that expression, do you know? Fergus, this is really fundamental. You see... The you Irish know, Constitution. Yeah, but you see, like the, the, the words that are used in these articles are different to the language that's used. This is, I've made these arguments to the best the, of my knowledge. Is this three. a specific section of the Constitution that's set apart, you would say, from the rest? Yes, it is. It's not only is it set apart, it's, it's actually quite different. It's beyond it. Yes, exactly. It, it, it's that their antecedent right, antecedent is a word used in several articles, antecedent, which means before, anterior. You see, these rights existed before the constitution was ever formulated. And right. they were simply, they they were, they're not written. They, but if they weren't written, if they, need, they, don't, they, they don't need to be written, you, you have them, written or not. You know, there are certain things which ought not to be done to you by any person or by the state. And that is the underwriting of those rights. The right to life, for example. I would say to the, to what, take the, the right to life issue, the Article 43.3. Uh, that was put into the Constitution in 1983. But by putting it in, we did not generate the rights within it. They were simply acknowledged, uh, acknowledged exactly. The state acknowledges the right to life of the child. It wasn't that the state now extends the right to life to the child. It acknowledges. The state therefore did not generate that right. The people did not generate that right. The politicians did not generate that right. Dahl Aaron did not generate those rights. They were antecedent and anterior and superior to all positive law is the phrase. And in the same way, they were the words inalienable and imprescriptible. They mean cannot be given up and cannot be taken away. Huh? Now, how on earth can the Irish people vote away rights that cannot be given up and cannot be taken away? They had no right to do it. was completely unlawful. All three referendums were utterly, completely unlawful. Because they don't believe in, in the sacred, which, which is another element in this altogether. Ah, ah, yes, indeed. This is exactly right. Uh, and, and that's why I say that, that the opening of the preamble is so important. Because a... Uh, I've, I've issued this challenge to, to many audiences and nobody's taken me up on it yet. Uh, uh, and I say to them this, okay, I, I, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I believe that uh, Jesus Christ is the Lord of history. I believe he's the son of God who became man and so on and so forth. All that. So I believe in the whole most holy trinity, in the name of the most holy trinity, in whom is all authority. I believe in that. But I say to the audience, okay, now, I want to say to you, those of you who don't share my beliefs, yes. you have a vested interest in, in, in understanding what's going on here. Because even though you do not believe the mechanism, the, that, that opening to the, pre, the preamble, which in one sense is an invocation, is a prayer. In another sense, it's a mechanism. And it's a mechanism for what? Well, it's a mechanism, as I say, for taking the most fundamental rights of the human person and placing them out of the reach of tyrants. So they're not generated by human beings and they cannot be reversed by human beings. They're interpreted by human beings, so. Yes, they are, but I and, mean. And I, I don't mean to jump in front of you like a speed bump. That's, that's not what I'm trying to do, but I, I don't think, I, I would love to have someone, uh, I would honestly love to share a debate between you and someone else on, on, on this because it's, it's something that we have kind of, it's well, like, yeah. You're it's right, like right. we've dealt with it and then we're not opening them up again, oh, you know? Oh, exactly. And, no, we didn't deal with it, you see, that's the problem. Well, Fergus, I no, no, because let me tell on. you, I, I was going around Ireland for about uh, um, a good six months before the referendum in 2018. Uh, 
okay. talking about these things. And I made several videos. They're still up there, a lot of them on, on, on YouTube, if you want to check them out. And I started off every night uh, reading, or most nights anyway, reading um, the opening section of Ghosts by Porrick Pierce. There has been nothing more terrible in Irish history than the failure of the last generation, and so on. And I explained all this, but not once was I invited on any radio program to elaborate on the argument. Not once. So, you see, we didn't have the argument. We didn't have it. We weren't permitted to have it. They covered it up. They covered up this central point. And, and not just journalists, but also lawyers. I, I, I spent six months trying to get lawyers to, to go to the, to the Supreme Court eventually. I go to the High Court first, I suppose you would have to do, and then end up in the Supreme Court. And essentially put this argument, and which would really could be rinsed down to two questions. And the way, can I just briefly, I know we, we, we've gone on a long time, but this is, so interesting. this is so interesting. What I said was, I, I want to personalize it. So I, I, I my, my, my uh, uh, stepdaughter was pregnant at the time with a little boy. And I put a name on him. I call him Tom, which is my father's name. And I talked about Tom throughout those, those uh, months mm. while he was in the room waiting to come out. What a glorious little fellow he is now, like, you know, he's just such a glorious little lad. And I, I, I put it to the, to the audience like this, because it was based on another experience that I had once of ending up in the dining room of a high court judge one night and when my own situation with my own daughter brought me there for reasons that I can't go into. Uh, I was seeking some relief uh, in respect from the court and uh, I ended up there in an emergency hearing. And uh, the most extraordinary thing happened, uh, which was that when the session, the court, the high court was sworn, was to be sworn in in the dining room, right? In front of the judge in his own dining room. And it turned out that when we got to that point that it was realized by the judge that there was no Bible in the house. So he had to send out next door to get a Bible, so to swear me in and so on. Mm. Anyway, that's by the way. But I said, okay, I imagine that tonight I'm going now to, the, to a judge in his house to make a case, not for all unborn children, not for any abstract principle, as it were, but for one child, a little boy called Tom. And I want to argue that Tom has a right to live. He wasn't under threat, thank God, but what, just for the sake of the argument. Yeah. And I said, well, what would I say to the judge? Well, I would have said, judge, um, Tom is innocent. Tom has done nothing wrong. Tom has done nothing at all, actually. He's never said a word. Completely mm. intent upon life. And I think I said I would say, Judge, in all the books you have around you there on your shelves, you won't be able to find a single sentence that delineates Tom from me or from you in legal terms. You won't be able to find a half sentence or a word. I mean him. once he's alive. No, no, right now. Right now, he is alive. He is alive. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but this if he's alive, you can't differentiate between John and Tom. Yes, exactly. He's a human being in law. There's no law that says that Tom is not a human being. None. There was then none, and there is now none. Um, and, 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 and my question is, on what basis can you judge put on the black cap and sentence Tom to death? Mm -hmm. And if you do, Judge, I want to ask you one more question. <laughs> Having done so, how now do you propose to protect your rights and my rights to protect us from the same consequence? Mm -hmm. <laughs> See? Well, John, you're dead right, Fergus. We never had this discussion. We were not permitted to have this discussion because the entire establishment is utterly, including the media, is utterly corrupt. It's this was sad. a deeply, profoundly corrupt process. 
under for three referendums. We caught them out on in the 2012 one, thanks to Mark McChrystal. We didn't catch them out because we were bullied as a people in 2015 by the LGBT goons who were allowed to get the run of the country and abuse everybody and that they got the Garda Shikona behind them. And then in the in the final referendum were essentially just ignored. So you and, and all of the, all of the time, the other side in these arguments, the yes sides was being pump primed mm. foreign money from Chuck Feeney's organization, Atlantic Philanthropies, and from George Soros's Open Society. And we call this a democracy. And all, John, the, you and all the while as well, sorry, just one final punchline. All the while, half over and above what was legitimate, right, and legal around the electoral registry. No, it's just because you said the, half no, a million. Half a million votes, 500,000. Mm. And nobody asked, who are these people and how did they get there? Because why? Establishing that these people were there because they kind of knew who they were and they knew kind of how they would vote. And that's the point. Again, to reiterate the point I made earlier, that we have arrived at a post-democratic context in which democracy is regarded as a terrible inconvenience. It's a bit of bureaucracy that we have to go through as politicians. I mean, it's like Pat Rabbit's famous saying, you know, oh, sure, that's only old stuff you say during an election. Yeah. All of this, this, this is... There you go. John. This. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. This this connection is has been iffy for the last about thirty seconds. Yes, there, okay, I could, see that. I, I see it blinking. All right, yeah, it's getting tired of me. Is there any way? Um, do you want to just clarify what you said over the last thirty seconds, or will we just plow on? It's pretty clear. I think it's okay. pretty clear, uh, Fergus. You, Thank you. You had, and again. I want to get on to other matters, but you you bring things up and I and I have to touch on them. And and that's how a conversation works, as you know. You had a chance to talk about whatever you wanted to talk about with Eamon Dunphy. And he might have been, you you feel unfair in the way he asked his questions about uh, conception and abortion. And you said, as far as I can remember, this isn't about uh, fudgy philosophical arguments about conception mm. and all that. I th I think it was a, a reasonable question uh, and and because it is, we talk about 12 weeks or 24 weeks or 8 months or whatever and, and there are different lines that some people draw that are uh, different from another person and it's a fundamental question just like you say it's a fundamental right. Where okay. is that line and, and why if life begins at conception, why is it yeah. OK to, to have the morning after pill? Can, can okay. you address no, that? OK, well, I, well, no, what I need to address is the entire uh, edifice Premise. that you've constructed there. Uh, first of all, I come back to that question if we have any time left, if it's not tomorrow. Uh, uh, because that one version of what happened, that's the version that was put out by the journal.ie, more or less. Well, I listened and, to the conversation, but go on. Well, you didn't hear the parts that happened before. So can okay. I tell you what happened before? OK. Uh, what happened before was that. Now, first of all, I'd say, you know, I've had a, a relationship with Emma Dunphy uh, bordering on friendship intermittently, bordering on profound enmity on other occasions over like, I don't know, 30 years, maybe more since the late 80s. Um, and you know, we've come and gone in different ways in each other's uh, ambits. And, you know, uh, uh, I've co I've complicated views of Emma. Yeah. And I'm sure he has even more complicated views of me. Uh, but what happened was that he, I had been out, as I said, talking about this referendum. And he picked up that I had seen some of my videos. And he rang me one day and said that he was completely disgusted with the way the, the campaign was being run and by the media, that there was only one side getting across and he wanted to give the other side a, a, a hearing, yeah. I, what I was saying. And 
he said absolutely explicitly, he said that, you know, it's a podcast, so I don't need to do any balance. I don't need to regard to have any regard for the BI or any of that nonsense. And uh, he said that he also said that he couldn't himself come out to speak. He said he was a no voter. He was instinctively no voter, but he couldn't come out because his family were on his back and, and you know, preventing them from speaking his mind on it. And he said he would like to give me an opportunity and as much space as I wanted to express the arguments I'd been expressing, which he said were really interesting. The kind of arguments that I'm talking on, that I've been telling you about a little bit, that's, there's a lot more, but that's that was kind of the general tendency of the whole thing. And so we had a long conversation on the phone and, and he said, you know, yeah, you can have the full podcast, you know, and, and you know, you, you know, I'll, obviously I'll, we have cut and trust and all the rest of it because I've been on with him lots of times. I've known, I've been on Dumpy, Dumpy on all yeah. kinds of situations. You know, we were, we did a, we were the three musketeers on the late, late for years talking about politics, myself and himself and Owen Harris. I think they call us the angry old men, and they were all old men, but I wasn't, uh, you know, which was very insulting to me, but Eamon was more insulted by it than I was. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, so, uh, so anyway, I, I, we all, we talked about it and uh, agreed and set up a time and, a, you know, and a uh, date. So I arrived, his studio was in, in, in South William Street, and there was a butler's on the corner, and I said I'd meet him there, as we always did, when I was doing a podcast, and, and, he came and he kind of started off, you know, my wife was with me at the end, he said something about, you know, uh, uh, I'm on the fence, you know, he said, I said, oh, I thought you were a no voter, and he said, uh, you know, I muttered something. And then he says to me uh, something about Una coming in, you know, and I said, I thought he was having a laugh. So I said, because <laughs> I, I kind of guessed who he meant, I mean, he knows yeah. that he knew the history. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he says, no, no, she's coming in. She says, uh, but you won't have to meet her, uh, you know. She, so I said, "Oh, right. So, so what? What's what time?" Well, you know, you'd, I was getting half the time, and she was going to answer, and she was going to be on afterwards. So already the thing was changing. Um, the goalposts were being moved. Very definitely be moved. Now, th there was another little bit of background. I've been on with Ivan Yates the week before on News Talk, and actually Ivan Yates gave me the best interview I got on the whole time that I did that campaign. He was very fair. He's actually a really good journalist, I think, Ivan, if he, if he could get away from that other fellow he does those programs with. Uh, uh, but uh, he, he, one of the things that I talked about on that was the whole concept of men bereaved by abortion, which is a thing you never hear about on RTE. No, I've uh, never heard that. Uh, that yeah, it's a real, a real phenomenon, you know. And very shortly, within minutes of coming off the program, I got a call from somebody, a friend who said there was a guy who had been on to him, and he knows him, and he said you've told his story, and he wants to talk to you. So I talked to this man, and and he 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 told me the most extraordinary story about having his child aborted against his wishes years ago, and ending up marrying the woman who had aborted the child and having two subsequent children with her. Now, can you imagine what that would have done to people? And it did, you know, and then they went through years of counseling together and all that, never recovered from it. And at one point he said he had written a letter to his dead child and he had it. And he said he, he would give anything if somebody could put it into the public realm. Mm. And I said, well, actually, funnily enough, um, I, I'm going on with Eamon Dunphy in a few days and uh, uh, you know, maybe I'll get an opportunity to read it out there. So would you give it to me? So he gave me a kind of a microfiche copy of it, which was really hard to read. But I read it. It was very moving. But I, I, I didn't want to read. I, I hadn't time to transcribe it. It's quite a long letter. But well, what it would take about three minutes to read, maybe. So when I was, when I, myself and Dumphy were heading into the studio, then I said to him, and I said, to him, I, I started explaining to him, but he was kind of noncommittal and, you know, a bit dismissive. And uh, I, I, my idea was that, OK, it might be tricky to read in the course of the, con the cut and thrust, but maybe as a coda on the end, I could read this at the end of the item and you could edit it back on or something, do it as a separate edit and then put it back, tack it on at the end or something. I don't know. He said, oh, you talk to my technician. And he went into the, the, the loo and I was halfway up the stairs and I headed on up to the studio. I'd been there before and I went into and the technician was there. I can't remember his name. 
It turned out afterwards that he was actually also a Mullally's technician. She was also doing podcasts and she, they shared a technician. And I started telling this, you know, this relaying the same thing to the technician. And he just gave me kind of a nondescript uh, answer, uh, total lack of enthusiasm for what I was saying. Then Dunphy came in the middle of it and uh, I kind of caught them by accident smirking at each other. And I thought, uh oh, -uh, this has gone a bit strange. And I thought, oh, this is not going to go the way I'd hoped. Because I'd spent like the previous few days working out in my head all but my best arguments that this was going to be the good platform, the great platform. Yeah. Get all the arguments in the mainstream that I hadn't been. Stand. Stand. Yeah. Great stand. Yes. Yeah. And so now suddenly something else was happening. So I was kind of looking over, they we're about to go on air and I was looking over Dumphy's shoulder out through the window and it reminded me of being back in school and thinking, you know, double science, you know, <sighs> you know, and I, I thought to myself, OK, you've got 45 minutes, make the absolute best of it, get your, condense your arguments out, get the best arguments out and that you'll, you'll do a good job. So that's the result to do. But from the very off, Dumphy started to come in and from a totally irrelevant place 1983 peter sutherland he started going on about peter sutherland and and the wordings and 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 all of this stuff ancient history nothing to do with what we face now don't be, like nothing at all of the conversation we'd had about what i was saying about what he thought was important and he was just and this is where the whole thing about the after morning after pill which was actually not what he, you know he was actually it isn't what he was talking about was not a morning after pill it was the abortion pill an entirely different matter but he didn't put it like that he didn't seem to know the difference between the two and uh, he kept coming up with filibustering and i kept trying to answer his his, his questions uh, but i had looked at the clock and the clock next thing there was 20 minutes gone and I read it. My time, my time is half gone, and I haven't even started to put set out my stall. I mean, if you have me on, Fergus, about a particular issue, if I go on a program to talk about, say, being elected, the first question you ask me is, "Why are you running?" And you give me a couple of minutes at least to set out my stall, as I say, and and tell people, well, what before you start to interrogate me, which is kind of what you did tonight. Fine, you know, nothing wrong with that. I've no quarrel with any of that. But that's the first thing you need, because I mean. Otherwise, you lose your bearings as as a, a subject in an interview, because you 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 can't ever say why you're there, you can't ever say what you're about, and unless you get the chance to say what you're about, so he kept going on. He just wouldn't. I I tried to get him on to what we were supposed to talk about, and he just wouldn't do it. So he was he was actually filibustering. I realised he was filibustering, and it was all a setup. And I just you know the red mist started to send over my eyes. And I just, and I just said what I said. It was just sickening. But he immediately got. I hadn't left the, the building by the time he was on to Journal.ie, getting publicity for his show, Cheap Shot. Uh, he had got a sponsor at this time, by the way. He told me on the way up the stairs also that he'd been, he got a new sponsor, which he'd been trying to get for ages, Tesco. So presumably they were less than happy about the idea of somebody advancing. A pro-life position, shall we say, pro-baby position, as I would put it, exclusively without challenge on their show. Yes. Uh, just as Una Malali's technician would have been unhappy about having to do twiddle the knobs for such a person. And so that's kind of what happened at Fergus, which is somewhat different. You see, I, I told all that to the journalist. Super, the last time I spoke to a journalist was the guy from uh, Journal.ie that day, who was a complete rat. Uh, uh, and uh, he he rang me up while you know pretending to be interested in what I had to say. I told him all of that. He didn't use any of it. He just used Dumphy's side of yeah. the story. That's what happened. So I did. I don't. I don't talk to journalists now. I, I I've been. I, I've had a number of inquiries from journalists over the past uh, weeks since I threw my hat in the ring for the election. Mm. I haven't responded to any of their calls. Yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, they're not journalists, Fergus. You know, I know you don't like me saying this, or I suspect you don't like me saying this. They're not journalists. I, they're not, you know, it's not even, it's even too nice to say it's Colin activists. They have no principles whatsoever. Well, I know people who, who would object to, to what you're saying, but that's, that's fine. 
<laughs> oh, I know. Well, I know they would object, but they'd be wrong because they're probably likely to be the most incriminatable in the whole thing if you actually went into it, frankly. Maybe, but I, I'd love to have a, a council. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to bring. I really would love to do this to bring an awful lot of people, but well, not an awful lot, but a number of people into. Uh, okay. Okay. Into one room and and to. Well, well, okay. I don't know when this will happen. When I'm home, can I, maybe. Can I tell you something? I brought out a book, as I told you, as you know, in November 2017, 18. 2017 or 18, sorry, it was 18, yeah. uh, describing all of the things that happened to me, going through the three referendums, all of, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about tonight was in that book. Yeah. There, there was an opportunity to take on Waters. Mm. We, let's review his book and show where he's wrong. Yes. Not one person wrote a single sentence about the book. Yeah. So, you know. So uh, here we are. Um, no, it's 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 been a. I don't. I I can't describe the course of events. I I don't know what word you'd use, but it's it's been bizarre. I think it it'll go down in history. I think you. No, it won't, no, it won't. No, it, John, you, you are you will be in the history books. I think someday. Oh uh, yeah, you see. No, I don't think so, Fergus. And I'll tell you why. And it's very interesting because you'll be written out. And it, well, no, no, no. You see, this is it. We'll all be written out. You see. If the present wave of uh, migration continues, the entire nature of Ireland and its culture will be altered beyond recognition. Its history will become irrelevant. Its history to date will become irrelevant. A new history will be written by a new people. Nothing will be remembered of me or you or Porrick Pierce or anybody. Why don't you tell Irish people to have more children? As I you do. said, like, uh, I do. I do have an article in GRIP this very moment, which ended up today, which is basically saying that, explaining okay. the problem of uh, the demographic problem and the fertility problem, and, and tracing it back to the 1950s. And, and it's quite an interesting article, I do, if I do say so. I have another, well, I have another good, very good article in, in uh, First Things, if I may say so again. Not, I don't praise you my own articles, but no it's about the whole question of whether or not the question of abortion can become a quote unquote settled question which is something that has surfaced in this campaign also, and not from the pro-abortion side. And uh, I kind of come to the conclusion that, you know, when it comes to killing, the deliberate killing of human beings, we can never become settled. What? Sorry, you, you, you mentioned one article before the abortion one. What was it? It's about the, the demographic question you referred to there. And, the, the, the and it's in first things? It is, yeah. Not first, no, it's in grip to this one, that particular it's in grip. Yeah. I want it's to ask you website, by the way, yeah. I, I want to ask you about um your journey from alcoholism very, very basically into Christianity or Catholicism or, or a renewed faith and a and a, a robust faith, I think it's fair to say, and uh, a really insightful amount of material that that has come from your pen since and and it's been a massive theme in your work the the sacred and the human being and god and all that yeah and so can you take me through uh you actually had an interview with sean o'rourke on i think in 2015 or 2014 where you talked about thomas 59 and you were taken out of context in an article uh, I think it might have been the Sunday Independent, I can't remember what newspaper it was, where they said that you said that depression was bullshit and all this, when it was really not the point of what you were saying. And yeah. you yourself didn't feel like you needed antidepressants uh, because you yourself were on a spiritual program, and uh, which consisted of what? Can you tell me? And, and just to confirm, was it who published that article? Sunday Independent. Okay, fine, yeah. So... Yeah. Um, I'll come back. To that, that. I'll answer your first. No, it's a big question, Fergus. So I, I'll have to really summarise it. You know, uh, yeah. uh, just in relation to the what you're calling faith. And I mean, I, I, I kind of, in a bizarre way, I have kind of quibbles and quarrels with that word uh, because it implies kind of a blind. Does it, you almost see the word blind attached to it? Well, I wouldn't. Me, I wouldn't. But go on. Faith is to me what is called faith is a very rational process, in my opinion. In my experience, uh, and the, the the question of alcoholism really that was the, what I discovered uh, through the process that I went undertook after stopping drinking was that 
fundamentally what I had been doing in my alcoholism was misunderstanding my structural desire, which was for something much greater than alcohol, and which I might well decide to call God if I chose to. And that's kind of the approach of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I followed that and I found that I learned an awful lot about my own structure and how I worked and the limits of my capacity and, and the nature of my desire and the scope of my desire. So I started to think about this a lot more deeply and to investigate it. And that kind of brought me back to, to, uh, to Catholicism. And then in 2005, uh, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger was an elected pope. And I had been reading some of his things and I became more and more engaged with the with the church in that period when he was pope. And uh, because he understood this fundamentally, you know, this question of the structural nature of human beings and that idea that uh, St. Augustine said, uh, you know, uh, his line was, uh, you have you have made us for thyself and, and uh, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, uh, spoken to God. And that's kind of the way that I think human beings are made, that they have a desire for the infinite reality. And, you know, the material things in the world appear to satisfy for a short time, but they don't last. And we become lost and frustrated and, and, and poisoned if we go too far down the wrong road, if we pursue a singular path, as I did with alcohol. And that that was a very interesting uh, journey for me, you know, and, and I, I wrote a couple of books on it. I wrote a book called Lapsed Agnostic, which is kind of about that whole journey. And then I wrote a book called Beyond Consolation, which was my reaction to, if you remember, uh, maybe you don't, the famous interview with um, Nulo Fuelon on the Marion Finucane yes, show. Yes, you know, I, I listened to that only a week ago. Ah. It was Sorry. really strange, wasn't it? Extraordinary, Sorry. I think is the right word. Extraordinary, it's right. Yeah, I wrote a, a book essentially out of that, in the sense that it 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 left me so troubled yeah. that I, I was with this question: Is Nula's response to reality a reasonable one or not? And I need to be able to answer that question before I can go any lot further. So I went into that question, and and. I've, I've written another book, up, which is kind of uh, the, the third in a trilogy, but it hasn't been published yet. I'm hoping it'll be published. As well. It was supposed to be published this coming year, but because I've been ill, I haven't been able to revise it, you know. Um, so that's kind of where that all that stuff uh, kind of gravitates. Um, what happened with the Sunday Independent interview, rather than not wanting to hark back too much to it or to, to the earlier Thomas 59 business, but it was follow on from that, that that journalist in particular, Neve Horn, she had been bugging me for weeks and weeks and weeks to have given her an interview. And I said, no, 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 I don't want to. And then I did an interview. I did an article for Village Magazine about the whole thing. Yes. A very long, very long article where I set out the whole thing, kind of, a, if you like, it's a kind of a condensed version of, some, of of the key parts of my book in that respect. There are lots of other yeah. parts of the book, but that was kind of a condensed version. And because uh, in fact, I took the book, the article that ended up in Village ended up at 7,000 words or something like that, but I actually wrote 25,000. So I didn't have to write an extra word for the book when I actually got to write the book, you know. I just had to filter fill it to kind of fit it around the other material. Uh, and and so I, I she asked me would then what when that article came out, would I do now do an interview? And I said, well, provided you, you know do it the interview about what's in the article. Mm -hmm. And she agreed to that. And so, but then she became, in the interview, well, the interview was very long, went on in, in a hotel in Sligo, and it went on for like over three hours. And she kept kind of trying to nitpick at things that seemed to me to be peripheral and to uh, ignore other things. Mm -hmm. not, she didn't ask me at all for about an hour and a half about any question about what was in the village article. She seemed to be going down different paths. And at one point then she started to say to me, yeah, but are, are you depressed? Are you de suicidal? And it, my response was to that question. And the meaning of my response was, look, to, to, to kind of uh, elongate my response, it would have been something like, look, 
we're not here to talk about that. I have views on that. I've written about it in the past, but we're not here to talk about this now. Can we talk about what you're here to talk about, right? And so it came out as something like, oh, that's a cop out, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's nonsense. Let's, let's get on with what we're talking about, right? You know, and that became the headline of the article. And the village article was never mentioned in that article in the Independent. That's that's the extraordinary thing. That's, this is what happens, you see. Which was the only reason you met in the first place. Yes, yes. You see, this is this is what I mean by by the, those words I use about journalism. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not they're not you know arbitrary. I'm not sort of just they're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not rhetorical. Yeah, I, I, I've experiences about all these things which bear out what I'm saying. Uh, you know, the only objective it's just like it's like the the Sunday Times guy. guy who finds some book in the uh, Revenue Commissioner's uh, annual report, which sounds like mine, and he's delighted at the opportunity that now we can get waters again. The scoop. Yeah. It's gotcha, gotcha, you know? Like, because not alone, the story would have been, not alone was waters going cap in hand to the revenue, but they turn them down. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? You know, since when did journalism become about that? You know, like, you know, and I mean, by the same token, I mean, in the last week, uh, the only articles that have been about my uh, uh, my uh, running for election have been two subjects. Well, one, one described me as controversialist. Like, I, apparently I've uh, created controversy about abortion. Right? Whatever such, that means. Well, it's obviously such an uncontroversial subject that, you know, my interventions must have been terrible. You know, I mean, I don't know. The second one is about my hair. I have this idea that there must be a module in DCU or DTEIT, you know, about, you know, how to write about John Waters' hair in a way that has not been done before, you know, in a more original way of writing about John Waters' hair. Uh, and then the third one then was that I said in the course of a, a public address in the course of the referendum uh, that if abortion was legalized in Ireland, I would have to leave the country. I've heard that really petty call out. Yeah, yeah, uh, it, it goes on, it goes on. I mean, there, it's just, it goes on. John, why haven't you left yet? That kind of thing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. I thought you were gone. Oh yeah, I was on the plane uh, uh, actually going to Spain on a week after and people were shouting at me like as they went really? on the plane. Oh yeah, it's, it's amazing this country. Uh, like. Uh, actually, I did go to Spain, but I came back. You see, there are plights in both directions. They don't know this sometimes. You know, you can come back from Spain if you choose. And it is my country, even though they've destroyed it in every conceivable way they could. But it's still my country, and I love my country. And I love my people. And I'm not going to be bullied out of my country by a bunch of Torags. Um, so, uh, so that was kind of what happened there with with uh, uh, that that Sun Independent interview, and subsequently the bizarre thing was that having spent uh, several months introducing every phone call when she would ask me about doing an interview with something online, lines, oh people are saying you're earning your money out of suing people, as if I'd never written a word or an article or a book. Yeah. And what happened next? I spoke about this on the radio. And she sent me a solicitor's letter. Wow. So that's the Irish media for you. Um, oh, sorry, having having just pointed the finger at you for. Yeah, well, I, I was asked about it and I give my account of it or a, a very condensed version of my account about it. And I, I referred to that there was a certain lack of professionalism involved, uh, which was the very least I could say about the situation. And uh, for this, she sent me a solicitor's letter, which I saw Accurate. often. After accusing you of making your money out of sending threatening letters. That's right. And after accusing me of, of not caring about... I, I was very funny. See, well, I mean, this isn't funny. It's very black. But at the same time, bizarrely, I was uh, being approached by the Independent to join them. Wow. This used to happen. I remember you, you did join them. I, did. For a I, stup I stupidly did. I stupidly did, yeah. I yeah. After I left the Irish Times, I was persuaded. Now, they had approached me before I left the Irish Times or before any of this blew up. And there was this used to happen every so often. Like I mean, I, I got about seven or eight approaches from the Independent over the years from different people asking me to join, you know. And they were offering me always far better money than I was getting in the Times. But I, I liked being in the Times, you know. Um, but uh, 
Anyway, in the course of all, there was a lot of to and fro in and meeting with different people. Stephen Ray was then the executive editor uh, uh, of whatever he was. Uh, what was it, what they call him? Editor in chief, I think they call him. And uh, I used to meet with him and one of his sidekicks. And we're up in the Gresham one day, very soon after this event, you know. And we're sitting down at a table in the lobby, you know, and or having a coffee. And, and uh, the next thing, this individual from uh, kind of an elderly man, not elderly, but kind of late middle age, spotted me from the far side of the lobby and he made his way purposefully uh, across the lobby in my direction. And when he got near, he started pointing and shouting, you know, Waters, Waters, I hope you die of depression, then you'll know it exists, you know, this kind of stuff. And uh, Stephen Ray was deeply phased by this episode, you know, and I do, I wasn't because I'm kind of used to this stuff, you know. And uh, uh, Ray is kind of shaking. Oh, come on! You had your saying, "Oh, you know, stinger hook," you know, or words to that effect. And uh, Ray turns to me and says, "Does this happen, happen often?" And I says, "All the time, Stephen." That's funny. You know, uh, it was his own newspaper that had created this situation. I mean, like the, the serious part of all this is that you know, for for this was in 19, 2020, 2015, I think. 2014. Uh, at that stage, I had probably spent about um, 20, certainly 20 odd years writing about male suicide and related topics in the Irish Times. And none of these journalists had shown the slightest interest in anything I said on the subject. And after that interview in this Sunday Independent, I was absolutely uh, vilified online and on Twitter and everywhere, and also was. I got phone calls from just about every media organization on the planet, including the BBC, who had never shown the slightest interest in anything I'd written before. Uh, that's, to my mind, evidence of corruption. But because anything, any journalist worth their salt would have looked, what has John Waters said before about all this? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, if, if it was on record, it, it, that should have been acknowledged. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I, I was, I mean, again, that was one of the subjects that I was regarded as having been banging on about, you know, male yeah. suicide uh, uh, and the problem of why it was. And I've written umpteen articles about it and also written articles about suicide in, in particular in general, you know, and uh, in particular the theories of, of Durkheim about suicide. Yes. And, and, and uh, I was very interested in all that because I'd known many young men who killed themselves and I couldn't really, I mean, you know, you know, we all have to be conscious. You know, this is the extraordinary thing that I find about feminism and the, to the tolerance of it in society, that as if nobody is any sons. Like, you know, I, I think about these things all the time. I, I take my little step-grandson to the park, he's little Mark, and, and now he, uh, that Tom, the Tom that never was. And, and uh, oh man, he's such a beautiful little boy and, and so full of life and spirit. He's like a mountain climber already. He wants to climb everything. but. You know, I, I just think, how can, how can people not be interested in discovering the depths of whatever darkness that has descended on the male species of the species when they see a little boy like this? Mm. Why would they not want to fix this problem? Why, why, you know, do we only fix the problems that George Soros wants us to fix? Hmm? Crickets. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Crickets, I said. Well, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what's what's happening to us. You know, I, I really don't. Uh, that we care less. We care more about the rights of pretend minorities than we care about our own children. It seems. Well, John, you've never been afraid to to say your piece and. Uh, I presume you're very busy with this whole election business. I, I think we'll wrap it up here. And All right. All right, Frank. It's lovely, it's lovely talking to you. I, I no, enjoy it. Likewise, and I'm very grateful that you've done this. This is a, a very long conversation, and it's getting getting up after 10 o'clock in Ireland. I'm lucky. I'm, it's I'm a, sick it, behind it's not you. A it's not a conversation, Fergus. It's a mini-series. 
It's a mini series, John. Um, <laughs> if, if, if I'm not reined in, uh, we'll keep going, you know, uh, yeah. if, uh, if you're willing. And um, No, no, well, no, I, I think we should, I mean, like... I, no, I, another time, you know, like, yeah, we'll, we'll yeah, back to yeah. this. I, I think, and, uh, I think uh, it's, it's... I'll tell you something, Fergus, I'm not patronising again, I hope I'm not, but I mean, you know, you're a young fella and, and uh, you're doing the things, you know, the way they should be done. You know, you asked me some pretty hard questions or, you know, tough enough questions. You're not you're not pandering to me in any way and there's no reason why you should. And you should ask me all those questions and I should try and answer them and whatever. And, you know, sometimes I get a bit tetchy and so on. That's all part of the game. Uh, but you, what you're doing is is real journalism, in my view. Mm. Not just with me, but in your general approach, I'm sure. Is, is, well, thank is, you. Thank is, you for it's that. Based on, it's based on a fundamental curiosity mm. about people and what's going on, and you, you're, you're, you know, and you have that openness and you have that fairness as well. Those two words have come up tonight, so you know, I'm very grateful to you, and and I, I'm very happy any time to talk to you. Brilliant. I, I might call what I have uh, a naivety uh, and uh, an ignorance, maybe, but uh, it's, it's a very. These are both necessary qualities <laughs> in a good journalist. I can assure you. Ignorance, ignorance. Let me tell you a story before I leave. Before we go about the great uh, Peter Kavanagh. I've told the story a few times, but I'll tell it to you now. Uh, Peter Kavanagh was uh, the brother of the great Patrick Kavanagh, the great Irish poet, and. Uh, in a, in a by, by a bizarre set of circumstances, I came to know Peter towards the end of his life. I used to read his books, like he wrote a book called Sacred Keeper many, many years ago, which I read as a young man, one of the great books that I've read in my life. And I met him, uh, he was in his 90s, and uh, Sacred Keeper referred to Peter, it was Patrick's name for Peter, you are my sacred keeper. He was the custodian of Patrick's work. That, that was the, now that went all wrong because of circumstances that I won't go into. Patrick got married and the line of the the inheritance went the other way, and, and oh. that was a terrible situation, which has been deeply uh, problematic and bad for Patrick's reputation in the world, and for Ireland's reputation in the world. In terms of uh, the, one of the great war, one of the world's great poets, is kind of only half known about now because of it. But Peter uh, came to Ireland in 2004. He lived in New York, and, and he, uh, he came to Ireland in 2004 to hold an event in in Trinity College uh, in commemoration for the centenary of Patrick's birth. And he wanted to speak about Patrick in front of an audience, which he invited he over 500 people, huge hall in Trinity. And he was looking for somebody to, to moderate the event and somebody mentioned me. And a lunch was set up in which we were to meet each other and discuss it. And uh, I ended up sitting beside Peter at this table in Patrick Gibo's, a place I wouldn't normally be found. But uh, uh, I was—I'm—I I'm believe it or not, Fergus. I'm a very shy person. People think I'm this extravagant, garrulous person. I'm not. I'm extremely shy. This is a. This is all uh, a creation, you know. I, all the ideas are all mine. But it's an. I at a certain level, I'm an actor of myself, <laughs> and and I think a lot of people are in public life are like that. Um, but. So I wasn't saying very much to, to Peter and he was saying nothing to me. And at a certain point in the conversation, we went on for quite a while and then he said to me, I'm reading your book. I wanted to make sure I wasn't dealing with a fool. I said, all right. Uh, and how's it going for you, Peter? And he said, I'm only after starting it. And I said, well, I suppose uh, it might be just as well. Why? Well, I said, maybe if you'd advanced further into it, we might have found ourselves with a difficult situation. Well, if I had, we'd have to deal with that too. And that was the way Peter was, totally direct. They believed, himself and Patrick were very like, they believed that telling the truth was a moral obligation no matter what the consequences. P Patrick had a very funny line once time. He says, you should always tell the truth even when it's in favour of yourself. Mm. Anyway, the, the, the lunch finished and no resolution was arrived at about who would moderate the event. So I went off and then a couple of, a week or so later, I got a, 
a phone call from an individual who said Peter had decided that I would be the man for doing this job. So on the event, on the, the morning of the event, Peter was back and I met him in the Shelburne Hotel. And I was very nervous about the whole thing, you know, I mean, just a nerve wracking. I mean, I was rereading everything Patrick ever wrote and reading everything Peter wrote and oh, I was nuts. And he was sitting opposite me in the Shelburne saying nothing as he was his wont. Uh, and next thing he says, he looks at me and he says, and he, he, in this time, he, he paid me in the space of about 45 seconds. One of the greatest insults, what I thought was one of the greatest insults I'd ever received, and then followed by the greatest compliment. Mm. So what he said was, and because it has to do with this idea of ignorance. Mm. He said, what I like about you is your ignorance. It's the same ignorance that Patrick had. Mm. You see? Ignorance is a virtue. We're all ignorant. The problem is some of us don't know it. <laughs> yeah. We're ignorant of our ignorance. Yeah. No, yeah. 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 So stick to that ignorance. Stay with it. It's good. And the naivety too. It's related. And the curiosity. <laughs> and the subjectivity. You Alabama, are, Alabama you, might be a good place for me. So I don't know. That don't, I, uh, try, don't try to be somebody else. Be yourself. Yeah. You're the, the reason I always employed journalists was because they knew who they were when I was an editor. I always told them that. You are you. I don't want you copying anybody else. Yeah. Like if, I want, if I want somebody to copy somebody, I'll find the person you're copying and I'll employ him and you'll be gone. So be yourself. Mm. Well, thanks a million, John. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Fergus. Enjoy, if, if it's possible, enjoy the campaign. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think it's meant for enjoyment. Maybe not. Politics, right. politics is hell on earth. Hell on earth. Thank you. God bless. Slow. Slow, slow.